listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White. And joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, sir? I'm delighted to be here and uh, I'm excited for today's conversation. I, uh, you know, Jeff, I, you know, we, we encounter in the world of kind of B2B manufacturing marketing. Um, you know, that's pretty specific for a lot of people. So they, you know, I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, then there's a playbook, right? Like for B2B manufacturing marketing. And the, you know, once you're into that space, then it's, uh, you know, a, a bit of a one size fits all can, or fits most at least maybe approach, right? And uh, I'm reminded of an old buddy of mine, actually, who's a, a blues musician, Matt Anderson, originally from New Brunswick. So listeners, please check out Matt Anderson on your uh, iTunes or, or, or Spotify or what have you. I think you'll be delighted. But nevertheless, his first album um, kind of was born out of the fact that he was like weighed over 400 pounds and was like six foot two and could never find clothes to fit him. And it was like, and the name of the album was One Size Never Fits. <laughs> And, and, uh, and it was really a speak to you, know, you. You talked about going into a Walmart or something and seeing a one size fits all t shirt and laughing at it. <laughs> but I guess that's kind of a roundabout way. As today's conversation, I think, is a great reminder that where you start kind of changes everything. And, and you know, some manufacturers are breaking you know, brand new ground with a new technology that nobody's ever seen before. Nobody even knows they need. And then others are entering a crowded marketplace that can sell what they do to an awful lot of people. And it, and, and that means that you're, you're kind of the, the, the what you do in each of those uh, circumstances, very different from one another. So, right. Yeah, and I think that's why I kind of, as I was reflecting on today's guests and kind of looking forward to today's show, I'm like, you know, uh, the starting point of this, uh, kind of the the complexity of um, of 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 where this mar this organization needs to start to go to market is just fascinating to me in terms of how that shapes the strategic options. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. One of the other things that I'm excited about is we're actually getting to talk to uh, the second person at this company that works in marketing in a very different area and using very different marketing strategies to bring their particular slice of the vertical to life. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, I think that's super it, cool. It, it is often very interesting to get those kind of those, uh, different perspectives. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, with without further ado, let's get right to it. So joining us today is Lewis Sims. Lewis is the head of industrial product marketing at Nexa 3D. Welcome to the Cooler Ring, Lewis. Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Stoked to have you on the show. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on the show. Um, yeah, uh, looking forward to it. I've, uh, I've I've been through the podcast. I uh, love what you guys are talking about, uh, you know, as someone who's in manufacturing marketing, uh, there aren't a lot of per perspectives that you can find very easily. So it's been incredible to hear um, people's different stories and backgrounds and situations within this industry. Well, and, and with a tee up like that, why don't you tell us a bit about your background and maybe introduce yourself to the listeners a bit more formally, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So today I'm the uh, head of industrial product marketing at Nexa 3D. Uh, Nexa is a 3D printing company that manufactures uh, 3D printers, provides uh, the materials that go with that, services and software as well. Um, and we are all about ultra fast 3D printing. Um, I've been in the industry for uh, going on 13 years now, so clearly something I love. Uh, and I have the opportunity to uh, geek out about 3D printing and all the different possibilities associated uh, every day. Um, so it's really exciting, something I'm very passionate about. And because we are in an industry where you can, you're producing something uh, that can make anything, um, it, it's uh, constantly evolving. There's always something new, um, and that really keeps the excitement going. Yeah, but it doesn't make it any easier when you can, you can make <laughs> practically, practically anything for everyone. It's like now, now where do we target, right? That that is the challenge. Yes. Uh, so certainly, whenever you're looking at uh, the 3D printing market, uh, there are 
an incredible number of competitors, particularly in the last you know five to seven years, we've seen you know this market expand uh, quite a bit. Uh, 3D printing, probably unbeknownst to a lot of people, uh, has been around since the late 80s. Um, so it's been around a lot longer than people realize, um, and then really exploded whenever uh, desktop 3D printing hit the market, um, gosh, about a little over 10 years ago. And that's really whenever it kind of worked its way to the forefront uh, of a lot of people's minds. Um, and so with that, there became a lot of new entrants into the market at both the desktop and industrial space. Um, and when you are building this product that can build almost anything for anyone and you're entering into a crowded market, uh, it becomes quite the challenge. You know, why, you know, what are these product features? What makes us different? Uh, from everyone else around us? Who should we even be targeting for this product? Um, those are all uh, very basic but very real conversations that you have to have from the very start um, because if you don't, you could end up with a product that is uh, either something that is you know, duplicative of something that other people offer um, or uh, you have an incredible product but you don't have the right you know, uh, addressable market identified. And, and I mean, another kind of side of this, too, is that kind of consumer crossover, I would think. Like, you know, if you're marketing 3D printing technology at the consumer level, you can kind of just kind of market dreams and possibilities and what could be. But, you know, as you're marketing it at an industrial level and actually attaching services that need to deliver to it, um, you, you maybe need to ground yourself a little bit more in the art of the possible. Absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head. So, uh, you know, I've worked on both the hardware side and the 3D printing services side. And I always say uh, that on the hardware side, you have the ability to kind of sell possibility. This is what you can achieve with this product. Um, and on the services side, uh, you have to really bring it down to reality, give a lot of, you know, guidelines um, and assistance and, and helping people to achieve what we call first time print success. Um, so that they can, uh, you know, reliably uh, produce something with these printers time and time again, which is incredibly important in a manufacturing environment. So I think that um, as you enter into this consumer space, again, people are really attracted by the possibility and kind of think, you know, all 3D printers are the same and you can build anything you want. Um, and and that, is, that is kind of the challenge. And so you have to uh, start to clearly or more clearly identify even in the consumer space, you know, who, who is your, who's your target? What are their app? What are the primary applications uh, that they are trying to serve with these printers and how do you do exactly what they need? And that is uh, make printing easy for them, help them achieve first time print success, help them um, innovate faster, help them build better products with 3d printing. Um, you know, and, 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 and while that's still rather broad, uh, you, you start to clearly identify, at least for us, um, a little bit more of what we call a prosumer market. And those are people that are, you know, either the individual engineer at a company um, or a very experienced uh, designer or, or, or 3D printing enthusiast that can benefit from our technology. Um, and then on the industrial side, you really get down to, uh, you know, really needing to achieve in industrial um, manufacturing capabilities. And that means not being able to make one good part one time. I need to be able to make tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of good parts. And I need that printer to be able to do that time and time again. And I also need, you know, if I have five printers, I need them all to be able to make the same part the same way to give me the exact same result. Um, and with a machine that can make anything, um, having something that brings that level of, of precision and accuracy is, is certainly an achievement. <laughs> well, I have to think too, because, you know, you mentioned that Nexa 3D is a bit of a, a newcomer, but there's even newer newcomers in the space who, who may be kind of presenting that dream with a bit less reality behind it. And you're, you're probably having to kind of reshape people's perspective and make sure that they understand exactly what is the art of the possible. 100%. Um, so, you know, competitive positioning is incredibly important in this market. You have 
uh, exactly what you said. You have new entrants to the market, people who are even newer than Nexa 3D, who are launching printers um, and, and honestly maybe trying to uh, reach up a little bit, maybe beyond the capability, of, the true capability of their printers. They're trying to um, expand that idea of what's possible, probably um, beyond um, the capabilities of that technology. And they're doing that because they see manufacturing as a um, as kind of the blue ocean, right? That's where everyone's moving. We, we prototyping is still, by and large, the uh, most uh, or, or the biggest application for three D printing, um, and manufacturing is, is uh, quickly expanding. You know, induced production of parts with this technology. So they're trying to reach up. Um, Nexa, what we did, um, which I think is incredibly smart. Um, is, is our, our founder, Avi, started with um, the idea that, or, or the, the concept that the world doesn't need another, just another 3D printer. Um, you need a printer that does something different, that delivers um, capabilities that aren't on the market yet. Um, and particularly, he zeroed in on the industrial commercial space. So what we did is we developed the, you know, what I call a you know, industrial commercial capable printer um, that answered a lot of the needs of manufacturing, you know, for those production components. Um, and then we took that technology and said, okay, now how could this be beneficial for that prosumer or consumer? Um, so we took the industrial technology and distilled it down. So we were able to take that technology and deliver something that was well within our reach to expand um, what we could do, you know, in this market. Um, and I thought that that was a really novel approach because we see a lot of reaching up and then people who are already in the consumer industrial space, just keep trying to go bigger. Um, they think bigger is better. Um, I, you know, let me sell larger systems or add more materials or, or do more things all at once. And, and really and truly what people need out of, out of a 3D printer, whether you're at that consumer level or whether you're at the industrial level is they just need that printer to do the one thing <laughs> that they bought it for and that's 3D printing and they need to do it extremely well and, and reliably. And so really trying to solve those foundational is issues for uh, customers uh, was what Nexa 3D is all about. Oh, within this industrial uh, space, I mean, I, I guess I, I understand how the prosumer side of it, uh, maybe people using the, the uh, technology in prototyping, et cetera, then see application elsewhere. But as we try to kind of just reach directly into the industrial category. Can you give us a sense of uh, of how you're reaching that market, how you're getting in front of it? Because it would seem to me like it's a fairly crowded space. It's a very crowded space. Uh, and so, um, again, we, we are all about ultra-fast 3D printing. And the reason why we focused on speed is because speed tends to be a limiting factor um, for the two primary applications for 3D printing, and that's going to be prototyping, which is the biggest application, and then uh, production. And that production might be, you know, series production, where you're making the same thing over and over again, or it could be um, what you might refer to as mass customization, where you're kind of building the same product, but maybe customized for the end user. Um, so every part you're building is a little different. Um, but those are the, the two main areas there. Now, um, on the prototyping side, you're prototyping, and this is you know, basically step one of, of trying to get whatever you're designing to production. Um, so 3D printing, while super beneficial uh, in the grand scheme of things, has been slow. So depending on the size of your part, it's taking hours to days to print, um, which is limiting your ability to accelerate that design cycle and get your product to market. So we solved that by solving the speed problem. We overcame a lot of the traditional um, physics of the process that, that limit your ability to print, print faster. So we solved that speed problem, and now you can print parts in minutes or um, you know, even larger parts in hours. Uh, you know, we have a customer in the medical space that utilizes the full build volume of our largest printer, and they have a print in about two hours. Um, we have, you know, other part uh, customers that have our desktop printer, and they're printing anywhere from they're printing parts anywhere from you know five to twelve minutes, um, which it, it is mind blowing when you think about the design cycle 
aspect of things, you know, so as you're trying to get that proof of concept, design, iterate, and, and, and repeating that process until you really feel like you have something, um, you are now looking at the ability to um, accelerate that process exponentially. So that solves the speed problem on the prototyping side. That same issue exists on the production side. They now see the benefit of 3D printing for production, but on the production floor, time is money. And so if you are spending hours and days printing your parts and you were only ever able to achieve, you know, low volumes um, cost effectively, that limits how you're able to leverage this technology. And so by solving that speed problem again, uh, we were able to broaden the applicability of 3D printing technology as a whole for a lot of different industries. And we see that across you know, medical, particularly medical device. We see it in the dental industry. We see that in the automotive industry and the consumer products industry. Um, they are all rapidly um, adopting this technology. Um, and some of that is obviously solving these speed barriers, but we're also benefiting from uh, kind of a more uh, macro level trend, and that is a post-COVID world. So, uh, it, you know, during COVID, manufacturing lines were shuttered or stopped. You had entire products that were, um, you know, there's a great example of a appliance manufacturer who their entire production line was stalled, not because they didn't have the appliance manufactured, but they were missing a clip, a really essential clip, and they couldn't, they, their supplier was over overseas, and it was going to be weeks to months before they get that, and so they just start piling up this inventory, and someone had the bright idea why don't we just 3D print it? And the problem is solved within you know, a day or two, and now their manufacturing line is up and running. So um, previously, adoption of 3D printing was, you know, when it comes to production, a, a, a grassroots campaign, if you will. Um, it was the individual designers and engineers kind of, again, speaking up towards management and to executives saying, look at what's possible, look at what we could do, what we can achieve, what we can, um, how we can do things differently or better. Um, and now it's actually being mandated from the top down. People, your CEOs, your C-suite are recognizing that um, leveraging such an agile technology like 3D printing can, uh, can really save them in a pinch. And so they are actively um, transitioning and, and building their uh, 3D printing capabilities um, out of you know, necessity and a little bit of risk mitigation as well. Yeah, I, mean, I just find that that notion of the... You know, how do we get there? How do we break through? And you really brought that down to we solve the speed problem. Um, and it's funny because I I meet two different types of manufacturers um, that are that solve problems. Some solve problems that nobody care about or know they have, um, and then they have to kind of, in some ways, then go out to the market and convince them that it's a problem, that it's a challenge, right? A absolutely. And 3D printing has been in that space for a long time. <laughs> yeah. But I guess I'm wondering, as you solved the speed problem, did you find that you were, it sounded to me as you were speaking it there just now, that it was, that you really, you connected with a, a latent demand in the market that they wanted this problem solved. They knew it was a problem. They didn't have to be convinced that the speed of 3D printing was a problem. Absolutely. Um, again, this technology has been around for 30 years. Um, there are people who have a lot of experience with this and kind of had just accepted that this was as good as it was ever going to get. Um, and, and, and so, again, you just kind of start working with what you do. You know, whenever you... When you go buy a car and you, you buy your, your Volkswagen Passat, you realize that it's never going to run like a Ferrari. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden the technology comes along um, and a big part of you know, our, our core messaging uh, and positioning at, at Nexa uh, was uh, ensuring that people understood that we were all about ultra fast 3D printing and high throughput capabilities. Um, and, and that message resonated extremely well with the market. Um, because again, we were speaking to a really basic problem. This wasn't about needing to make something new or different. The technology can already do so much. This wasn't about um, you know needing necessarily a bigger printer or more detail. You know, people are printing um, at ultra fine resolutions with you know tolerances plus or minus 
the width of a hair, um, you know, so that that, that was already there. Just no one could solve the speed problem. And so we did that. Um, and it, it, it really did resonate. It sounds like, it sounds very basic, um, but it was really getting at the core need or, or, or problem um, that consumers already had identified, you know, or even our, you know, in, at the industrial level and the prosumer level had already identified speed as a problem and had just kind of accepted that um, as something that wouldn't improve or wouldn't improve, it, you know, in the near term. Um, and so we kind of flipped that on its head. It was really interesting to see the response from the market. I, I, I think that you mentioned the simplicity of it, but I think that's the secret. Um, I guess if I'm going to, it, it, it just, it, it, this is a really weird parallel, but I'm reminded of some, a, a couple of local uh, telcos up here in, in Canada that were battling it out over internet speed. And, you know, one, because one used fiber technology and the other used cable technology, there was just kind of basically, um, there was a built-in infrastructure advantage with one provider versus the other. So they, they got the claim that they were faster. I mean, the numbers don't lie. You know, this car goes faster than that car kind of thing, right? And the other one was kind of had to try to sell the more nuanced conversation about the speed you need right like almost <laughs> like the downstream effects and okay well this is what th this means and that means and you don't really need all that speed or whatever and i always thought at the time as a consumer witnessing that that man like nobody's listening to the rest of your argument because we've just decided that speed is is the is the thing and faster is better and and that's what i kind of like about what you position here is that yeah, there are there, there are implications to being able to do this faster. There are supply chain um, efficiencies. There's risk mitigation. There's uh, uh, more rapid, agile prototyping. Uh, product development cycles can shorten all those things. But there's a lot of ands when you start explaining all those things. And you need to get a exactly. lot of sentences strung together. But when you just say exactly. we're faster, all of a sudden I know it. But you still have to back up the other part to make sure that you could do the thing that people are going to want to do and 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 you've done that and yes but people won't listen to you unless you are fast yeah no no i know exactly so you have the differentiator but then you also have to prove that the quality is there and and i think you know you lewis you're telling us a, a bit before about the um the sample piece that you develop with the printer that can be run extremely quickly through the printer with, you know, and do things that are impossible in all other types of manufacturing. Um, that kind of backs up the quality credentials quietly while you go to market as, as the fast printer, right? Absolutely. So, you know, a, you know as, as you guys acknowledged, uh, you've got to, uh, to grab their attention. Um, and that, that is the speed factor, right? So you've got to solve their basic problem. And the reason why you have to acknowledge that is, is people are going to have a lot of different um, reasons, just like you mentioned, some people need agile prototyping, some people need high throughput for production, and this printer can make anything. So if you try to overcomplicate that message and start to, you know, uh, try to speak to the why you need this one level deeper, um, but bring, the, a, a, but start there, um, people stop listening. They, they really do. Um, because you can't anticipate everyone's need. And for a product that makes anything for everyone, you can't come up with, you know, the, the whole uh, spectrum of, of potential situations and try to speak to that. It, it's, it's madness. Um, so you, you speak to that speed and then you say, okay, now you need, now that you've got the, them hooked, how do you prove that? How, what's the proof behind um, this statement? Not only that it can build something fast, but that it can meet your other needs. It can make a nice prototype. It can deliver the accuracy, reliability, and repeatability for production. And again, how do you do that concisely in a way that speaks to, again, still a broad audience, but that they can see their problem solved, um, you know, in, in whatever your, that example is. And so for us, we find that seeing is believing. And so we do uh, a lot of heavy pushes for a sample request program where you can actually go in, you can select from a variety of different materials, and we print um, what we call the X-Rook. Uh, so it's a very uh, detailed chess piece. 
Um, and, and, and a chess piece uh, has been picked because it actually has a long history in the 3D printing industry. Um, it's been around since the 90s as kind of a demonstrator of what's capable with this technology. Um, so we said, okay, let's do the chess piece. It's something that people recognize, but let's take it up to three levels and really uh, try to showcase everything that we someone might need in, in this piece. Um, so it is an incredibly intricate and detailed piece. It's got, you know, when you're thinking about trying to convince someone from to move from CNC machining to 3D printing, it shows that you can quickly do um, overhangs and undercuts and, you know, complex curves and stuff like that very easily and cheaply. Um, it shows detail and accuracy through um, printed in texturing, right? So, you know, texturing is very common uh, for injection molding. And so being able to see that, oh, this printer is capable of doing this in this fine detail. Um, we also offer uh, tolerance guidance. So you can actually measure this. Um, we'll provide you with a, a copy of the model or the measurements. And you can say, oh, wow, this just came out from you know, their lab. And it's within, you know, five, ten thousandths of, of the original design, which is, is on any given feature, pretty exceptional. Um, and so it's this one design that kind of, again, further captures the attention and, so, and, and, and acknowledges that we are capable of solving people's problems, whatever it might be within that space. Um, and so that's kind of why we push them there. And then, then do you also tell them how fast it was produced? We do, we do. Absolutely. And we do that um, at a material level, right? So again, this is where you... <laughs> you're letting them kind of tell you exactly what they need um, and we push them to kind of a, a gated landing page they can you know fill out their information we they pick the material that they would like this product produced in um, and even just understanding that you now know what printer they're interested in you now know what uh, material they're interested in and that tells you a lot about their application before you ever talk to them and so we're able to explain to them, you know, the performance of the printer, the material they've chosen, and, and then get down to uh, the details and the performance, reliability, and repeatability of those two solutions combined. Um, and again, very quickly speak to the heart of, of their problem. I don't want to come up with ideas in the room, but I think you should shoot a video of the sales guy producing this piece in the material that they requested in real time with the timer up beside it and send them both. Send them the video along with that. You know, it's funny, it's funny that you say that, but we have actually been uh, tossing that around. Um, so we're, we're looking at opportunities to uh, further expand that experience, um, kind of a, uh, uh, you know, you, you build something, they put it in a box, it takes seven days. Um, you know, how do you maintain that excitement from the time they put in that request um, to the time that they receive that part? Um, and how do you show them and illustrate to them the manufacturing process um, whenever they're not in, in your lab or in your facility? You know, we ship all over the world, and then we've been talking about exactly that. Um, so doing videos, showing our lab technicians building their part and their material um, so they can understand just how fast this works, um, exactly, you know, even the process of, of, of building the part. Uh, you know, there's a lot of complexity that can be built into 3D printers. So it's also important to illustrate not only did, you get you, did we get you the part that you need um, and to the spec that you needed it at, um, but that we did it really, you know, quite easily too. That speaks to the capability of the printer. Man, I got 40 ideas to build on Jeff's amazing idea there. Um, I just think like <laughs> I'll take can, them all. <laughs> oh, we can, you can unleash those lab techs as almost like secret salespeople. My goodness. Anyway, I mean, it just, my mind is just spinning to the personal connections that can be built uh, as part of that. And I, and I don't want to jump past. Um, just a great bit of advice that you gave her on about that bottom of funnel conversion. Let's just think about what what is that sample request program? Well, that's what it is. It's a bo very bottom of funnel conversion, and you've built in um, mechanisms to gain a, an, an additional layer of sales intelligence and an additional layer of account intelligence as part of that conversion. And I think for marketers listening, you can take that and apply it to your own situation. Um, I think that's just very, very smart. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's quite critical for uh, for us uh, in particular. Again, it's the ability to build anything for anyone. So any opportunity that we have to quickly and easily gather intelligence uh, makes our sales process easier um, and frankly reduces the amount of discovery that we're requiring of a customer. You know, no one likes the general sales call of, you know, oh, hey, so we saw that you downloaded this white paper and maybe you're interested in, in our solutions and, uh, you know, what do you need it to do? And have you ever used 3D printing before? And, you know, I think we've all seen kind of where the people attempt to um, to execute that sales call maybe a little bit too early in the funnel where they have to do all this discovery and you know i guess depending on your industry maybe that's necessary but in today's marketplace where the calls are coming too often where the, your email inbox is blowing up with a bunch of unsolicited <laughs> communications um, any opportunity that you can have to quickly and concisely gather that intelligence is super important and you'd be really surprised um, at how easily a recommendation can come for a 3D printer or for a 3D printing solution by answering just three questions. And that's, what do you need it to do? For how long do you need it to do that? And in what environment? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that example, that, that example that you mentioned about the salesperson kind of having to do that call and, and kind of almost start from scratch. Um, you know, really what... Boy, that worked really well in 2013 though, right? Well, I like, mean, look, a, a good salesperson can still get away with it and you yeah. can still navigate the dialogue and build rapport and do what you need to do. There's no question. But I think the the piece that's kind of jumps out to me there is that there's an asymmetry. Like at that point, the buyer has done a lot more research than the salesperson's aware of. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in some way, kind of the... They don't necessarily expect that the salesperson's been watching them do that research or knows everything, but the fact that they're starting from a different place and the salesperson's kind of rewinding a bit it does kind of hold back the progress of that sales conversation. And I think that that asymmetry that you're you're attacking as we build more account intelligence into those bottom of funnel conversions and inform those first. Uh, you talk about. Uh, quality of first print or first output of the device. Uh, this is more about quality of first sales conversations, quality of first sales contact. Absolutely. Yeah. Customers are walking in more informed than they ever have been. And I think we see this across different industries. Um, but, you know, certainly for us in 3D printing, you know, when I entered this industry, you were having basic conversations with, you know, what is 3D printing? How does this work? And people just thought, you know, you took dust and put it, I literally have an article um, that was written the year that I started in 3D printing where, you know, a, a journalist came in and um, explained it in a way that it sounded like we swept dust off the floor, put it in a printer and made their part. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, and, and that was obviously incorrect, but that that's the level of um, understanding that we were we challenged with a decade ago. Um, Today, people know all about 3D printing. They've done the research. They've probably researched your competition. They know the specs and what makes your, your printer different, you know, at least on paper. Um, and, and that's why you really do, you have to elevate um, your, your approach with, with these contacts. You know, you have to, uh, sure, be prepared to talk about your product. They don't understand it to its fullest capability. But more importantly, you're moving beyond, here are the features of my product, and you're moving into more quickly a conversation of how does my product solve your problem? Um, and if you don't walk into that conversation, at least having some idea uh, of what that problem might be, then I think you end up with a really frustrated uh, first time experience, you know, on that sales call. So, you know, from a marketing perspective, quickly and easily trying to gather that information, um, providing resources to your CRM. So you might be able to see what web pages they were checking out before, uh, looking into their company, you know, uh, making all of that information really accessible and really easy um, for the sale, just makes that conversation a lot more straightforward um, and, and frankly enjoyable for, for both parties. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that's a very good point. It's 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 uh, both people win uh, in that instance. Um, Lewis, look, I, I think we could go on forever here. Um, it's uh, the time has flown by, but. I, so I, I think 
let's just uh, want to just thank you for for sharing your your experience and, and expertise with our, our audience today. I think it's been uh, just a, a fascinating kind of discussion and uh, uh, a lot of uh, great nuggets. Uh, not to mention, I think Jeff's uh, lovely idea on that video piece. Oh, absolutely! Like I said, I'll take all the ideas. So y'all, y'all feel free to let me know, and we'll, we'll add it to the list. Um, but no, thank you guys so much for having me. You know, I would say if, if there's one thing to take away from some from a guy who works in the industry where you can make anything for anyone, it's uh, to do the exact opposite, and that's to define who you are, who your target is, keep the messaging simple. Uh, and, and to speak um, directly at the heart of the problem. Um, and I think in a lot of industries, you'll find that you kind of rise above the noise um, and, and will find success there. I love it. Very cool. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. All righty. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to The Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash the cooler ring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring.